So a while back, I talked about Elastrals, a game made by YouTuber A-Drive, which was, until recently, one of the most successful games funded on Kickstarter. It's a game of cute critters that are played using a custom-tailored spirit portfolio that a player may spend however they please, though they are also your life points, so careful investment of these spirits is the key to victory. Now recently I went and met A-Drive in person at Too Many Games in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and while I was there he passed me a review box of his newest set Frostfall for review. And he said to give it an honest review, and, well, ask and ye shall receive. Frostfall is the first major expansion for Elastrals and introduces the ice type with the new spirit card Flurmine, which is based on an appropriately wintry animal. The strategy for this new element seems to be digging things out of the ice while burying your opponent in snow. It has a lot of cards that interact with the underworld, as well as pretty substantial lockdown, including probably the best floodgate in the game. Any deck not packing direct destruction is going to see this card emerge from the side a lot. Ice has a few more detailed gimmicks as well. The starter decks both have some ramping effects for their boss monsters, the Ursa archetype just got the boy half of the group, and there's Morfrost, who puts the Snowman in Abominable Snowman as a horde of shape-shifting snowball monsters. These things help Ice feel distinct from the types we've gotten before. The card I consider most interesting, however, is Emphrostix. Right now, Elastrals has a bit of a problem with how easy it is to set up an oppressive back row that can shut down a lot of strategies. Emphrostix is one of the first examples of an Elastral that can be discarded for effect, making it one of the safest plays in the game, as not only does it not require an open back row, there are currently no counter runes that can deal with it. This might be a bit of power creep, but honestly it feels more like an effort to stop the oppressive back row by forcing a greater variety of playstyles to make it harder to shut down. Just be careful this doesn't get out of control like actual Yu-Gi-Oh! And by the way, no, M. Frostix cannot target itself with its own ability, I checked. Other interesting things in the set include new evolved forms of Elastrals from the first set, with the added touch of reprinting their base forms with new artwork. The spirits got new artwork too, along with the new Flurmine spirit cards. There's also a neat quirk where a lot of the new Elastrals closely resemble other Elastrals in a neat bit of biodiversity akin to the game Magi Nation. However, while all of the locations from the first set were reprinted, as each element got a card that checks to see if certain location cards are in play, they sadly did not get new artwork. Kinda wish they'd given the Foloi Forest card some art from the audiobook at least. The starter decks have gotten a makeover, now shipping with three booster packs in a box that can hold the entire deck sleeved as a fun bonus. Bonus booster packs are always nice, and you know I call them the greatest starter deck sweetener there is, but three might be a smidge excessive if it causes the price to tip over. As for the booster boxes, well, you're gonna have to hear me out on this one. Like the base set, the booster boxes contain 36 10-card packs. Cool, right? But then you realize that this set, minus special cards and basic resources, is just 84 cards. This kind of blows away my old ratio of 5% of the set size rounded up plus 1 plus extra, which would give us a pack size of just 7. Add to that the fact that each booster box has 36 packs, and we hit a problem that only I tend to notice. So most people are familiar with Pack Chaff or Pack Filler, which are cards added to bulk out a set, which are often vanilla and usually bad, but I have a term called Box Chaff, which is how many cards in excess of full playset a box gives you, meaning that they are cards that you essentially will never need. So I'm sure you're wondering, how much Pack Chaff is there in a single booster box of Frostfall? Yep. Now, ideally, the amount of box chaff in a single booster box is zero, where players basically get copies of all of the lower rarity cards, but not a lot of complete playsets. This has the benefit of adding value to cards of lower rarities, makes additional box buys more satisfying, and boosts trading potential, allowing people to add value to trades incrementally, all while building community in the process. And while I understand that a 10 card pack feels better than a 7 card pack, and a 36 pack box feels better than a 24 pack box, this feels generous to the point of being wasteful. I mean, this is nearly a third of my box here, and that's just one box. Any additional product that I buy beyond this box, I'm only going to be checking for the rare cards, which to me is just 
kind of super dull and repetitive. I can't really trade these either as everybody else who bought a box has the exact same problem. And we can't really say that it's this size for draft because a land station has yet to be made for this game. Shattered Stars has the same issue with having one of five random rares in a playset 3 game when the rest of the common cards are all the same in every single pack, so even an optimal pull where you get one copy of everything nets a bunch of chaff. Which is a shame! These alternative arts are great, and I feel they need to shine more. So, there are a few solutions to these problems. One is to increase the set size, thus meaning the 10 card packs are much more vibrant and diverse. Another is to decrease pack size to better fit the scale, but I think I have a third option. I honestly think that these boxes would be better if they were lean and mean. 24 packs at 10 cards a pop with a decent chance of packs containing a bonus rare, maybe by leveraging a foil slot of some kind. Shattered Stars 2, I would maybe convert it into something more resembling a secret layer, where one pack costs more, but it contains a copy of every single card, with some sort of bonus for people who have signed up to get three copies of the Shattered Star packs in order to get the full playset. Maybe that's the role the stained glass card should have. And maybe a land station, please? But like I said, I think the set itself is fine. Ice does a lot to distinguish itself from the other elements, and basically every single other element got one or more hybrids to make ice immediately splashable into any deck. Like I said, my issue stems more from the distribution model that I feel kinda cheapens these cards and their characters. I'm somebody who believes that how your cards are sold and presented is as important as the designs on the cards themselves. I have done entire videos about exactly this. Every rarity should have cards that have value. But to have a bit of a reality check, I have met A-Drive, and he strikes me as a generous guy who doesn't want people to walk away feeling cheated, hence why these offerings are so smothering. Trust me when I say I assign neither malice nor incompetence for why the boxes are the way they are. If anything, I think the term too much of a good thing is applied best, but I do think it will work out better in the long run if the offerings were more humble in their presentation. They would not only be more cost effective, but would allow every card to shine more brightly. Keep these things in mind and you too can create a better card game, I guess. So anyways, that is Frostfall by Elastrols, and until next time, this is Kodak signing off.